Welcome, everyone, to the world of Ronma One Half. In 1987, Rumiko Takahashi had been working on her successful manga Urdesei Atsura for nine years, telling the convoluted romance between Lum the alien Oni and Ataru the reluctant and perverted Tomobiki high schooler. Urdesei Atsura had garnered critical fame in Japan since its first publication in 1978, and from there inspired a generation of creators, getting a well-regarded anime adaptation by Kitty Films that spanned most of the decade. In addition to this, she had also been working on Meizani Koku since 1980, which found success among readers who enjoyed the mature tone of complex romance and slice of life elements. So it's safe to say that Takahashi was as popular as ever in the world of manga serialization at this time, but as people would soon find out, she was just getting warmed up. By the end of 1986, Kitty Films had wrapped the original Odyssey Atsura anime. And with the exception of its additional bundle of movies and OVAs coming in future installments, main production had ceased. At this point, Takahashi was nearly 30 years old. She had worked on Urdesei Atsura and Meizani Koku for years, and felt that it was time to retire those IPs and expand to new ideas, as she felt the two series were largely definitive of her 20s, and it was time for something new. In her words, quote. Urdesei Atsura was a manga I drew, putting all of my youthful energy into. It is not a work you can draw when you get older. I didn't want to draw a work with the wrong energy. Just for some context, in 1987, the manga industry was absolutely bursting with titles from all backgrounds and disciplines. Akira Toriyama was seeing massive success with his series Dragon Ball, earning an anime adaptation from Toei, as titles like City Hunter and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure were solidifying their legendary status in the world of Japanese media. Now, Takahashi herself was quite influenced by battle-themed manga and enjoyed fighting sports as a theme of entertainment in general. She frequently watched Fist of the North Star, among other fight-focused IPs, and at this point decided that it was time to put this inspiration to work in her new series. For this, she would tackle one of her major themes in manga going forward: martial arts. But even before all of this, Rumiko needed to decide who her main character would be, and this, my friends, brings us to chapter one. Before anything else, Takahashi needed a protagonist and a name for her new series. She was inspired by the proverb "kaito ranma o tatsu," which roughly translates to "tackling plenty of tasks diligently." Takahashi felt this quote embodied who she wanted her main character to be, so she extracted the word "ranma" from it and used it as her new protagonist's name. Thus, Ranma was born. Now, according to Takahashi, Ranma was always going to be a gender-bending character. In an interview from 2016, she recalled, "Quote: Gender bending was the starting point. Then the idea of water turning Ranma into a woman and hot water turning him back into a man." Unquote. Takahashi knew she wanted a story where she could balance a male and a female protagonist through the narrative as a naturally occurring theme. This was originally because she wanted to exhibit both genders in her protagonist, and ultimately, when she couldn't pick one over the other, she shrugged and just thought, "Well, why not both?" So that's exactly what she did. The next step would prove harder. Takahashi thought about how Ranma would change from a man to a woman and back, and admittedly, she struggled with this idea at first. It was only when the vision of an onsen noren or a cloth divider popped into her head that Takahashi incorporated the hot and cold water dynamic into the story, and from there, the ideas began to flow. Ranma would get his or her abilities to change genders from a cursed hot spring in a mythical region of China, known as the Juzenkyo Training Grounds. And the reason Ranma went to China, well, that was to study martial arts. At last, things were shaping up, and Takahashi was beginning to form the narrative of what would arguably become her most successful series of all time. And so she got to work on the first pages of her new manga. Ranma and his dad Genma Saotomi show up at the residence of the Tendo family in Japan one day, 
However, instead of a man and his son greeting the Tendos, we get this exchange instead. Now, right off the bat, this story expands on a plethora of concepts found in Rumiko's previous work. It's got love triangles, but no alien girls, romance, but with a twist of acute insanity, and to top it all off, a main protagonist who switches from a guy to a girl depending on the temperature of water in the room. And unlike Arise Atsura with its resetting story structure, and Meizani Koku with its continuous one, Ranma took a more varied approach to the way the plot unfolds. Rather, it blended what worked with both of those series, carving out a continuous overarching narrative that gradually sees episodic stories and arcs displaced throughout its many volumes. Together with this in the story itself, Ranma One Half officially reached publication for Shonen Sunday magazine on August 19th, 1987. Now, in the midst of the Japanese bubble economy and the manga craze of the 1980s, Takahashi's works had earned her a fierce devotion from many, particularly young adults and college students who enjoyed the carefree antics of her many characters. With a new publication under her belt, Takahashi and her assistants began churning out Ranma chapters consistently, serializing weekly installments that chronicled the lives of the Furunkin youngsters and their funny misadventures. Chapters would feature her signature comedic storytelling, as well as the newer incorporation of regular fight sequences, something rarer in her previous work. It didn't take long to spark interest with new readers either, and the lighter nature of the narrative with the shonen aspect of martial arts gave the series a wide appeal to audiences all over Japan, and as she would soon find out, all over the world. But before we delve into that, it's important to break down the heart of this series, and that of course are the characters of Ranma One Half. Now, just like my Urlese Atsura video, I'll try to focus on the core cast as most of the story focuses on recurring characters and their many interactions with Ranma and Akane. But in any case, first we have Ranma Sautome. Ranma is the bombastic and only son, well, half-son, of Genma Sautome. One day during a trip to China for special martial arts training, Ranma falls into the mythical Jusenkyo hot spring of the drowned girl, only to re-emerge as, well, you guessed it, a girl. <laughs> this curse is the first catalyst for Ranma, and much of the series is spent with him looking for possible ways to break the spell. Now, originally, Takahashi wanted Ranma to be a more clean-cut, open-minded character, though, as she described, he ended up resembling something more loud-mouthed and stingy, which I think fits him well. Overall, Ranma is an extremely likable character, one of my favorites among the cast, and easily a more sympathetic person than most of the cast of Urlese Atsura, which got a lot of its charm from how awful the characters could be. Here, however, Ranma always comes off as an overconfident but genuine guy who deep down really cares about the people around him. He's got a lot of abilities and an ego that can bruise easily at times, especially when he's embarrassed or loses in a fight. His relationship with his father is also pretty hilarious, as both are willing to consistently betray each other's trust to get what they want. And I suppose it's also important to note that he's got a lot of fiancés, and I mean a lot. And though that could technically put Ranma in a harem protagonist's seat, this dude's definitely not the type for that as you'll see, and I also don't think that was Takahashi's aim with this series. In reality, Ranma is much more concerned about proving himself in combat and undoing his Jusenkyo curse than about romance or sexuality. In fact, the way he nonchalantly parades himself around in girl form is more or less proof of that. Ranma is Ranma, male or female. And Ranma doesn't always hate changing into female form either. He finds it particularly useful when he can manipulate others or get what he wants as a girl. Though this can have consequences, like a bunch of people from both genders falling in love with him slash her, as well as some hilariously embarrassing situations. In addition, it's interesting to see how Ranma becomes more comfortable in his girl form and expressing a feminine side as the series goes on. And although he always asserts he's a boy, the line between the genders continues to fade as Ranma becomes suspended in harmony. Effectively, it's him who decides what he'll be no matter what his physical makeup entails, and I think it's that sentiment that resonates with a lot of people, including myself, as Ranma learns to express himself in the ways he chooses to. 
and Ranma grows a lot over the series, becoming more accepting of others and himself as he slowly develops his various relationships with the people around him. In conclusion, I think Ranma is an absolutely fantastic centerpiece to the story in both the manga and the original anime. Now let's take a look at the super fun cast of supporting characters, starting with Ranma's dad, Genma Saotomi. Genma is a martial artist who left his wife to train with Ranma long ago. He, like Ranma, also fell victim to the curse of the Jusenkyo Springs in China, only Genma fell into the spring of Drowned Panda instead, alluding to his first appearance as the Big Fluffy Bear in Volume 1. He's a funny character, often serious but in situations that emphasize the ridiculousness of his motivations. He can also be quite greedy, and though he's got a good heart, he has no problem throwing others overboard for personal gain if worse comes to worse. I love this character, he's an absolute riot in the series. Next is Son Tendo, the standing patriarch of the Tendo family and the school of anything goes martial arts. Now Tendo is a serious but sensitive man, Ranma consistently frustrates him, emphasized in the wonderful and hilarious sequences shown here. And Akane also makes him cry often, even at the mention of a passing obvious joke. He's a wacky one for sure, and I can totally see why he's friends with Genma. Also on another note, I'm really glad this series has at least some of the parents because I've always felt the overtired trope of high schoolers with no parents is wasted potential in most series, and this is certainly proof of that. These guys are hilarious. Next we have the older Tendo sisters, Nabiki and Kasumi. Nabiki is the funny one with her capitalist mindset and the never-ending desire to make a buck at another's expense. She can be a terrible person, and I love her. If you want a story arc that really shows her off, check out the chapters in volume 17 and 18 where Nabiki becomes Ranma's fiance. No major spoilers here, it's just a lot of fun to see one of the funniest characters get some good screen time. And then there's Kasumi, love interest of the hopeless romantic Dr. Tofu and the eldest sister and more motherly figure in the group. She's kind, pretty, and soft-spoken, and a nice little departure from the wacky nature of the other characters. Overall, she helps to balance the mood and rarely has dramatic moments, unlike, well, literally everyone else. This leads us to Ryoga Hibaki, who has a slightly similar relationship to Ranma as Mendo did to Ataru in Urdase Atsura. Ryoga is a man who believes in honor, has the worst sense of direction in the entire universe, and never gives up on a grudge no matter what. He also is a victim of the Juzenkyo Hot Springs, turning into a cute little pig Akane calls Pichan when splashed with cold water. Now, throughout the series, Ryoga proclaims himself as the main opponent to Ranma, and is very strong in his own right due to surviving out in the wild since he, well, can't ever seem to find his way home. But over time, Ryoga goes through change. He falls hard for Akane, like, super hard spending what time he can cuddled up to her in his piglet form and lashing out anytime Ranma says one bad thing about her. And though I admit it's very morally questionable that he literally sleeps with Akane as a pig without her knowing he's, well, actually a guy, Ryoga is a genuine person deep down and I do find myself rooting for him often. His interactions with Ranma are hilarious, and his blowhard attitude contrasts really well with Ranma's joking disposition. And in their bro moments, when they have the occasional truces and are friends for like two seconds, it's great to see Ryoga loosen up a bit as well since typically he's wound tighter than my grandfather clock. He's a good guy and I do like his little relationship thing with Akane, it's cute. Other than Pichan, that, that shit's kind of weird, but yeah, Ryoga's a great addition to the cast. And so now we move on to a man who is, in my opinion, one of Ranma's biggest consistent threats in the series despite his, well, tiny, insignificant appearance. And also probably the single most annoying character in the series, if I'm going to be completely honest. Hapasai is in many ways the biggest hindrance to Ranma as a character throughout much of the series, a very perverted old man with a bad temper who has the devastating power to unleash irreparable damage on those around him. And all of that, of course, is hidden behind his absent-minded, stupid face. Of course, that doesn't stop Ranma from challenging him, and what usually results are some of the most interesting high-stakes episodes of the entire series. Takahashi herself said that Hapasai acted as a good device for moving the plot forward by introducing new threats to Ranma, 
and in that way he does keep things interesting, even if he is still a perverted old freak running around with women's underwear most of the time. But yeah, he's annoying. In addition to Hoppasai, others announce themselves as consistently recurring opponents of Ranma. Let's start with this guy, Tatewaki Kuno. Kuno is the captain of Furunken High School's kendo team and a smug challenger of Ranma, though they are definitely no match in skill level. Kuno can also be very dense, not being able to tell that male and female Ranma are literally the same person after everyone else in the school already has. Instead, he announces his love for female Ranma consistently, much to her chagrin. Kuno also has an eccentric sister known mainly as Kodachi the Black Rose, and she is very strange. She claims to be in love with male Ranma and pursues him relentlessly with a sense of haughtiness that can only be experienced by watching or reading the material directly. And on top of all of these two weirdos, this fucking principal guy is their dad, and he is so weird and may I say uncomfortable. <laughs> An absolute king of cringe for sure, and very hard to take at times. Just read or watch a couple of chapters with him if you don't know what I mean. Because trust me, I swear he makes the other two look normal. In any case, it's undeniable whenever the Kunos are around, there's never a dull moment. Other than that, there's Gosen Kugi, the insane kid who makes nonchalant death threats on a regular basis. And this guy, Moose. He shows up occasionally to challenge Ranma out of revenge, but usually loses on the account of his extremely bad eyesight. He also transforms into a duck when splashed with cold water. This is a result of Jusenkyo Hot Springs. So that's most of the main secondary characters covered, which leaves us with a few of the most important characters in the narrative, mainly Ranma's fiancés. Now, it's good to note that these individuals were chosen for him as opposed to by him, and show various degrees of affection towards him. Let's start with a fan favorite in the community, and certainly one of my favorite characters in the entire series, Shampoo. Shampoo is a Chinese Amazon warrior who originally vowed to kill female Ranma after being beaten in a fight, but quickly does a 180 and vows to marry male Ranma when he beats her again in a second showdown due to an ancient village tradition. Shampoo is very cute in appearance, often wearing traditional Chinese clothing, and speaks occasional phrases in Chinese and the rest in slightly broken Japanese. She transforms into a cute cat when splashed with cold water, which triggers Ranma's greatest fear, as cats petrify him. Shampoo's great-grandmother, appropriately named Cologne, helps her run a cafe in Japan and is in many ways one of the guiding figures to Ranma in quite a few stories. Shampoo is also very devoted to Ranma, rejecting her main suitor Moose and being the most openly affectionate of Ranma's fiancés. She is also the catalyst for some of the wackiest and most inspired humor in the Ranma One Half lineup. Next, we have Ukyo Konji, another character I absolutely love. Ukyo is a childhood friend of Ranma, engaged to him through a crooked deal between Genma and Ukyo's father that involved trading Ranma for an Okonomiyaki cart. Yeah, Genma's still got a few priorities to, uh, to sort out. But at least he's still a better dad than this guy. In modern times, Ukyo dresses in often tomboyish clothing, sports a nonchalant attitude, is quite affectionate towards Ranma, who she regularly refers to as Ranchan, and runs an okonomiyaki shop in Tokyo near the Tendo house. Ukyo is full of charm, and she's always a delight whenever she shows up, delivering some nice comedy with a bit of delicious okonomiyaki on the side. She's definitely in the running for my second favorite Ranma character. And so, friends, this brings us to Akane Tendo. And I saved Akane for last because I think if I were to say who I felt grew the most emotionally as a layered character within the original story, I would have to put both Ranma and Akane on that list. Her sundere nature is played up a little bit more in the anime adaptation for sure, but there's just something about her that I absolutely love. And so, let's talk about that, and why Akane is my favorite character in all of Ranma One Half. Akane is the baby sister of the Tendo family. Her mother died when she was very young, and other than her older sister Kasumi filling a surrogate motherly role in her life, Akane grows up without much of a feminine influence. She gains a love of martial arts and builds up her strength, opposing those who constantly challenge her, like Kuno and her many potential suitors at Furunkin High School. 
Akane has a very interesting relationship with her feminine side as well. In the beginning, she reaffirms this idea that she hates men to Ranma, though this is largely due to the male idiots at her school constantly challenging her in hopes that if they beat her in a fight, she'll go out with them. In the end, this hatred proves largely untrue as the story progresses and we learn of Akane's soft side, which becomes more known to the audience as time goes on. Akane keeps her hair long at first for Dr. Tofu, a man she's crushing on who claims he likes longer hair, but she eventually moves on after her hair is cut short during a battle. As it turns out, she ends up preferring this style and keeps it for the rest of the series. It's also fun to note that Takahashi actually didn't like drawing Akane with long hair initially, as she was never happy with how it looked, so the short hair was a welcome change for her when it was eventually incorporated into the story. In a way, it was more or less the beginning of Akane's development as a more complex character going forward. Now, it's undeniable that Akane's got a seriously notable tsundere streak, particularly with Ranma, and this may influence one's opinion of her character. She can be overbearing, annoying, loudmouth, jump to conclusions way too fast, and do a lot of those things that modern tsundere's have become infamous for. However, I do maintain the opinion that dismissing Akane as just another one of those Tsundere characters would be missing the nuanced depth and care that goes into her personality. She's much more than just some girl with a very bad temper. And to be honest, a lot of her bashing on Ranma in the manga is just a direct result of him cracking some mean joke without thinking or being oblivious to her feelings, so in a lot of ways, they're even. Akane can be really sweet, and she repeatedly shows in the series that she's willing to go through a lot to support others, like how she traveled to the wilderness to help Ranma when Hapusai took away his strength. And even though she was terrible at cooking, she tried in earnest anyway because she wanted to be useful and see him succeed. Akane isn't the type to show her love up front like Shampoo or Ukyo. Rather, the way Akane shows she cares is through the little things she does for Ranma, giving him a blanket in the cold, helping him train, her apologies whenever she misinterprets a situation, and how she repeatedly thinks about him and often defends him even when he's not around. Probably my favorite arc between them is when they have to play Romeo and Juliet in the school play. If you want a bit of romantic cuteness mixed with hilarious comedic timing, this is a great one to check out. It's interesting to note that this arc also shows how much of a romantic Akane can be. Akane is a very jealous person, and she'll often spy on Ranma when he isn't around to see if he's cheating, which he never is, but a lot of the times she also spies on him to see if he's okay in the event of a fight occurring, and if she can help him in any way, shape, or form. In most cases, these scenes are played off by Ranma's cluelessness to her plight, but what's left is this subtle messaging about Akane's perceived romantic intentions that Takahashi folds deep within the pages of her manga. Akane quickly becomes flustered around Ranma. She cares about what he says and takes a lot of his words to heart, which actually tends to play into her jealous and often immature reactions to his joking nonchalance. They'll have scenes where Ranma just makes some sort of offhanded comment, and then boom, you'll turn the camera around and see her and she's crying. And it's like, whoa, what happened? You know, and that's how Akane is deep down. She cares, she's sensitive, just like Ranma. So, in essence, and in fact, Akane isn't the really hard-to-like macho girl that she's first presented as. In reality, she's actually a deeply romantic person, who while being independent and strong, is also showing a willingness to care for others, and even fall in love in the process. And I love that about her. She falls in love with all of Ranma, male and female, and she's not just a set of tropes, she's a genuine person through and through. Too bad the guy she falls for takes like 38 volumes to reciprocate the feeling, but hey, that's more content I guess. But that my friends is Akane Tendo. Hopefully this video at least sheds some light on why I love her so much, and honestly, I feel the best way to experience her character is through the manga. It develops her soft side more so than the original anime, which tends to play up her violent nature for laughs. She might need some anger management in both versions, though. I'll definitely concede that fact. And of course, with any Rumiko Takahashi series, there are many other great characters. But these are the ones I feel that we get to know the best throughout the series, and the ones that most significantly impact the events of the story. So with that in mind, let's move on to the next chapter and tackle the nature of Ranma through its artwork, narrative, and of course, action.
Welcome, friends, to Chapter 4. Now, initially, Ranma one half featured more traditional methods of martial arts, scattered throughout its first chapters. The content was wild and hilarious, of course, such as Akane's fight to school every morning or Kuno's advances towards Ranma, but the actual methods of combat were still loosely based on the idea of traditional kicking, punching, and evasion. However, over time the narrative began to take shape, leading to more and more fantastical elements which combined the absurd humor of Ranma's world with that of the traditional martial arts to create some seriously wacky fight scenes. Basically, take any normal activity and you can bet that Takahashi put some martial arts twist on it. Just to name a few, we've had martial arts cheerleading, bathhouse foo, martial arts figure skating, probably the weirdest form of martial arts I've ever seen in martial arts dining, takeout and delivery, tea ceremony, badminton, and the list goes on. And of course, this fits very well within the context of the Anything Goes School of Martial Arts, where Akane, Ranma, and company more than regularly find themselves trying to beat their enemies and prove their worth in various weird forms of combat. And so, in many ways, the martial arts of Ranma contrasted beautifully with the other more mature and serious narratives of the time. It provided a different interpretation of martial arts and fighting, which still feels as fresh and enjoyable today as it did when it graced the pages of Shonen Sunday back in 1980s Japan and beyond. Now, Anything Goes Martial Arts is essentially the philosophy of blending many different fighting styles in an attempt to employ the best of each style in your battles with an opponent, taking techniques and modifying them to ridiculous proportions in order to prevail in combat. For example, take the Heaven Blast of the Dragon, which Ranma must learn to defeat Hoppasai when he becomes weak from a Moxibustion. Essentially, the user must develop a cold and desensitized aura. With this, they need to confront their opponent's anger or passion, which manifests itself in an opposing heated aura. With the hot and cold auras, the two must battle in a spiral motion, which allows a surge of air to build up and the temperatures to mix. When it reaches the middle, the cold air user must undercut sending everything up in a whirl and creating the blast. Essentially, this is based off of a natural formation of a tornado, which forms when hot and cold temperatures combine in an updraft of varying molecular densities. So in other words, Ranma essentially creates a man-made tornado that consumes him and his opponents. Takahashi is very adept at demonstrating the wacky techniques of Ranma and company through her expressive artwork, which showcases the fluidity of the fights through clean lines and clear moves that the reader can easily follow. It's usually not too hard to read her battles, and the action is drawn with a flawless simplicity that is so characteristic of her signature style. With Arete Atsura, Takahashi was able to show battles as a general thread of the story. In Ranma, Every character has their own unique fighting style, right down to the way they kick, punch, react, evade, and reflect attacks. Ranma's attacks are based on strength, speed, and accuracy, with him picking up new ways of utilizing these characteristics in fights as the series goes on. Similarly, Akane's main staple is her immense strength, and she's a well-proven martial artist as well who adapts to weapon-based combat easily in addition to barehanded attacks. Shampoo uses largely weapon-based combat and is very acrobatic, and Ryoga's style often mirrors Ranma's, with them squaring off a near-equal platforms in terms of raw physical ability. Ryoga is also self-taught, and his strength largely comes from his terrible sense of direction, as previously mentioned, which means he hikes for months at a time, just trying to find where he needs to go. So their fights don't always happen, sometimes they get delayed by, well, a couple of years. And these are just a few of the characters on the overall fighting scale, which in Ranma 1 half has an insanely steep curve regarding combat ability. Even despite Ranma's world-shattering strength and agility, he still loses to Ryoga and Hapasai in the series, and they all get defeated by enemies even more powerful. No matter how good Ranma gets, there's still 10,000 more powerful than him, and more powerful than them. But instead of letting this deter him, Ranma as a character is very stubborn. He won't quit until he defeats everyone, gets his Jusenkyo curse solved, and is able to stand as the most powerful person alive. But until that happens, he's gonna have to keep fighting no matter what. 
As I mentioned earlier, the fights are often absurd and the stakes are sometimes outright ridiculous and often have to do with Ranma's various engagements. And this adds a lighthearted element to the story that allows it to have the same fun that the characters in Odyssey Atsura had, but in a fresh concept and world. And even outside of Japan, its influence was beginning to brew among international fans, and this trend would only continue through the next decade. In the next video, we'll discuss how the series grew across the ocean and became an international phenomenon that boosted Takahashi into an absolute manga legend. And of course with it came that great anime adaptation as well. And so everyone, that's where we're going to leave it today. But let me know what you think of Ranma One Half, and some possible things you might want me to cover in part 2. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.